hiking trails are fun and all, but they're also super creepy. Like you never know who could be lurking in the woods ready to pounce. One time, a couple in the 90s set out to hike the entire Appalachian Trail, but they never finished, and it wasn't because they were tired. So the Appalachian Trail is the longest hiking only footpath in the world. It's over 2,000 miles long and crosses through 14 states from Maine to Georgia. That's pretty long, which means there are plenty of opportunities for some creepy mountain man to attack. 26 year old Jeff Hood and 25 year old Molly LaRue met in Salina, Kansas. They were both social workers for a church sponsored program where they took at risk youth on nature trips to help expose them to the great outdoors. But when the two found out they were about to be laid off, they started to brainstorm their next move. Jeff and Molly were both unsure about they wanted to pursue next, but they knew they loved each other and the outdoors. And that's when it came to them. They were going to hike the Appalachian Trail. It would be the perfect way for them to get to know each other and decide what they wanted to do next in life. Before their trip, Molly called her dad and told him she was going on a six month cross country hike with her new boyfriend. Whew, I bet that was a tough phone call. That's a lot of news to drop at once. One time I called my dad and I had to tell him that I'm going to Thailand with the boy I'd only known for two weeks. I feel you, Molly girl. So the trail takes six months to complete. You can either start in Georgia and hike to Maine or go the other way around. Nine in 10 people start in Georgia, so naturally Molly and Jeff decide to take the path less traveled and start in Maine. So Molly and Jeff began planning their trip for the summer. Molly wiped out her savings and stocked up on everything she needed for her and Jeff's journey. On June 4th, the couple began their hike. They started at Mount Katahdin in Maine and began making their way south. They took a bunch of pictures and signed in on trail logbooks along the way. They were thriving. So a lot of hikers who signed these logbooks would write about their experiences, leave words of advice, or express gratitude for people who kept the trails up. But they all signed off with their trail name instead of their real name. It's like the old timey version of an Instagram handle. So Molly went by the name Nalgene and Jeff went by the name Clevis. You could tell the duo was having a blast on the trail because they left behind upbeat messages. One time, Molly wrote this super quirky poem in one of the logbooks. It said, last evening I whispered, I think there are less bugs. This morning, bring on the slugs. Through the roof of our tent, I see their familiar sludge. The stuff that resembles butterscotch fudge. Squish between my toes and my sandal. Yuck, this is something I just can't handle. Okay, Dr. Seuss. One of the hikers who was behind them on the trail named Earl mentioned reading this poem when he was tired, in pain, and covered in blisters and mosquito bites. He thought to himself, how could this Nalgene person be so obnoxiously happy? Well, I'm glad he said it because I was thinking the same thing. Like they had to be so exhausted and smelly at that point, but Molly somehow still the energy and enthusiasm to write a poem about slugs. Could it be me? When I'm hiking, I'm like so in the zone, sunscreen's on, backpack is full of snacks, water is full, couldn't bother me. So Molly and Jeff continued to hike all throughout the summer. Earl said the couple continued to write upbeat notes in the logbooks, and he actually ran into them along the trail that July. Earl described Molly as blonde and dimpled, quick to smile, spirited, and funny. He described Jeff as bearded and beetle-browed with a smoky, high-pitched Tennessee drawl. Okay, based on those descriptions, I feel like Earl had a crush on Molly or something, because he was so nice in describing her, but then said her boyfriend was beetle-browed. Seems like someone might be a bit jealous. When Earl met the couple, he was with another hiker named Greg. They had all stopped to stay at a shelter along the trail in New Hampshire. All four of them were getting to know each other and talking about their experiences when some creepy dude named Reuben came up to them. Reuben was super rude and demanded the space along the shelter's east wall where Greg had already set up camp. Has this dude ever heard of the term first come first serve? You can't really make reservations in the mountains. Greg stood his ground and told the dude he'd have to settle for a spot in the middle, but Reuben continued to cause issues. The next morning, Reuben woke up super early and started chanting and dancing around in the middle of the shelter for like two hours. Yo, this dude has got to go. These people are probably so sleep deprived, like they don't need to deal with some weirdo performing seances. Earl, Greg, Molly, and Jeff continued on their journey and actually met up again at a bunkhouse in New Hampshire. They had a few drinks and stayed up super late talking that night about the trail, Molly and Jeff's plans to attend grad school, and they roasted Reuben a bit. After their gossip session, the group split back up and got back on the trail. Earl ended up straying from Greg. Molly and Jeff had a bunch of late starts and lunch breaks, so Earl then passed them up. But they stayed in touch through the logbooks. On September 11th, Molly and Jeff stopped in Duncannon, Pennsylvania. At this point, they were just a few days from reaching the halfway mark. That night, they decided to treat themselves to a hotel stay. Oof, I bet that shower felt so good. I hope they had enough shampoo though, because like the hotel shampoos are always so small and these people were probably stanky. They got a room at the Doyle Hotel, which was right along the trail. It wasn't a super nice hotel, but Molly and Jeff didn't care. 
Honestly, they were just happy to have a mattress to sleep on. That night, they ordered pizza, called their parents, and opened some mail that was sent to them by friends. The following morning, Molly and Jeff packed up their things and continued to head south. They made it to the Thelma Mark shelter on the top of Cove Mountain in Pennsylvania, which is where they spent their last moments alive. So the shelter was a three-sided lean-to nestled in between some trees about 30 feet off the trail. By the time Molly and Jeff had gotten there, they had already hiked through eight states and covered about 1,000 miles. So they were super beat. They got all cozy in their sleeping bags and fell fast asleep. That next afternoon, a couple who called themselves the Lone Moccasins was trekking along the path where they planned to take a break at the Thelma Mark shelter. What was going to be a relaxing pit stop turned into a tragic discovery because this couple stumbled across the corpses of Molly and Jeff. The Lone Moccasins freaked out and rushed to the closest town to report the bodies. Yeah, I bet that couple was trying to get out of there super quick so they didn't become the attacker's next victims or the detective's top suspects. Later that evening, the police arrived at the shelter to investigate, but they were struggling hardcore. Like, it took them three hours to get there because it was dark and they said they were in dress shoes. Someone gonna tell them they could have changed their shoes? Once they finally got there, officials determined that Molly and Jeff had been lifeless for about 12 to 16 hours. Officials noted that both victims didn't pass away immediately. They laid there and lost fluid for several minutes until breathing their last. After talking to some locals and a few other hikers who were on the trail, detectives were able to gather a description of the perp. They were looking for an unkempt white male wearing a flannel, jeans, and work boots. He was seen carrying a small rucksack and two bright red gym bags. The people who described the man said he looked like a hitchhiker who didn't belong on the trail. I can't tell if they're hike shaming this guy for not having the right gear or if they're just trying to say he looks suspicious. Either way, detectives searched for the man around the area but had no luck. Eight days later, two hikers spotted a guy that fit the description. But instead of wearing work boots, he was wearing Jeff's hiking shoes. He was also repping his backpack and watch. Yo, did this dude seriously just take out Jeff for his kicks? That's pretty extra. So the hikers who saw this man reported him to the National Park Service. Later that night, he was trying to cross the Harper's Ferry when officials stopped him and brought him in for questioning. The mountain man said his name was David Casey Horn from South Carolina. But detectives saw through his BS and found out he was actually a man named Paul David Cruz, who was on Florida's most wanted list. So Paul was the leading suspect in a major crime that took place in Florida four years earlier. What's the crime, you ask? Slaying a young woman. Well, we know he's capable of doing that to Jeff and Molly then. In July of 1986, a woman offered Paul a ride home from a Florida bar. And something terrible must have happened on the drive because she was later found lifeless on an abandoned railroad bed with her head almost completely severed from her body and her clothes off. Paul drove her liquid stained car to his brother's place in North Carolina. He knew the police were after him, so he got his brother to drive him out of town and give him a stack of cash. The police eventually recovered the woman's car and clothing as well as Paul's blade, but they couldn't find Paul. From then until this moment, Paul spent his time hitchhiking around, until he landed himself in the interrogation room for Molly and Jeff's slangs. Unlike most crimes we cover on this show, this one was pretty easy to solve. Not only was Paul wearing Jeff's backpack, shoes, and watch, but he was also still carrying the weapons he pulled on the couple. It was a blade that was used on Molly and a 22 caliber pistol that was used on Jeff. Paul's DNA was tested against the sample found on Molly and it was a match. And as if it wasn't already clear as day that Paul was the guy the cops were looking for, he left some of his belongings at the shelter and dropped his red gym bags along the route. Okay, Captain Obvious. And with that, Paul went to trial. Over 150 pieces of evidence were presented and around 60 witnesses took the stand to testify against Paul. The jury took 49 minutes to deliberate and came back with a verdict, guilty. Paul was first given two terminal sentences, but that was later reduced to life in prison. He is now serving his time at a jail in Pennsylvania. But even though Paul was caught, detectives still couldn't figure out why he attacked Molly and Jeff. They weren't sure if the couple was in some kind of trouble, but based on their good reputation with the other hikers, that was highly unlikely. They also didn't know if they were approached by Paul in their sleep or if they had a conversation that escalated to their attack. Before their brutal demise, Molly and Jeff actually made plans to meet up with their family at the halfway mark, which was in Harper's Ferry. A few days before their scheduled meetup, Jeff called his mom and asked her to bring soap and brushes so him and Molly could clean up. Jeff's mom agreed and even told her son she'd bring him two pumpkin pies. You know, the most essential thing for a hiking trip. Before hanging up, Jeff told his mom that he and Molly had something special to share with the family once they were all together. Jeff's family speculated it was an engagement announcement, but they never found out what it was. 
Wait, that is so tragic and such a cliffhanger. I hope that was the news because that would mean they were at least happy and in love in their final moments together. Oh my gosh, this is like the hiking version of the Titanic. In Jeff and Molly's last logbook entry, they responded to a previous hiker who claimed he was the last of the 90 southbounders. They wrote, you most certainly are not the last entry of the season. As you can't read this, we'll tell you when we catch you. As we hear it, we're about mid-slip of the southbounders moving down. Oops, getting food on the book. Good food too. Time to go. Clevis and Nalgene. And that's all they wrote. The story of Jeff and Molly sadly isn't the only horrific slayings that's happened on the Appalachian Trail. I mean, it's a pretty long trek, so there are bound to be more crimes that have happened over the years. There are 13 reported slayings that have happened along the path. The oldest known incident took place back in 1974, and the most recent incident happened in 2019. About half of the cases remain unsolved to this day, which means the villains are still out there on the loose. And it also probably means there are a lot of vengeful ghosts along the trail too. Okay, so after hearing this story, I don't think I'm going hiking anytime soon or at least not on the Appalachian Trail. Hmm, maybe I'll just put a tent in my backyard instead. That way I can steer clear of creepy mountain men that want to steal my shoes and annoying guys named Reuben who perform noisy early morning rituals. But I'll definitely still roast some marshmallows for s'mores. That's a must. Stay safe out there. I'll see you next time, hopefully.